greetings from Rome. I am still in Rome, and uh, I've been here now for a week studying exorcism, which has been a fascinating subject, to tell you that. In any event, we are at the Gospel of John, and John is a very important gospel. <clears throat> and since this is a New Testament survey, we only have time to give a brief introduction and address a few key issues uh, throughout the book. Among these, of course, we have the divine nature of Jesus, or the deity of Christ. While the fourth gospel does not mention its author, tradition and other hints, including church fathers, of course, hold that John did pen this letter down. According to Eusebius, Eusebius, the church historian, <clears throat> he writes that John resided in Ephesus at this, you know, uh, during the end of his life. So it's believed that John wrote his gospel from Ephesus, from his home, that served as a type of home missions ministry or fellowship. Most importantly is the fact that it's written from the point of an eyewitness, you know, one of the twelve disciples of Jesus. Also, we have strong reason to believe that the beloved disciple uh, is none other than John himself. Um, you also observe John's early involvement in the early church, the first church. Um, according to Paul in Galatians 2, verse 9, John is mentioned as an esteemed pillar. It says, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed we would go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, which of course would be the Jewish community. Uh, James, Cephas, and John are esteemed pillars. By the way, Cephas is an Aramaic term for uh, Peter, indicating that um, it's also an early usage uh, uh, for Peter. In any event, uh, <clears throat> you see the same in 1 Corinthians 15, um, and scholars, of course, give it an early date because of the usage of Cephas. As for the dating of the book, uh, the early church fathers dated somewhere between 80, 85, and 95. Some have suggested also that the usage of the Sea of Tiberias in chapter 6, verse 1, um, in the case it was written later, why? Uh, it was a common usage for the Sea of Galilee towards the close of the first century. Uh, so towards the, the end of the first century, it was common usage to refer to the Sea of Galilee as the Sea of Tiberias. So John's Gospel in that case only dates some 20 years following the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, in addition to his Gospel, of course, he wrote three epistles in the book of Revelation, most likely from Ephesus as well. Some have speculated that the book of Apocalypse or um, the Apocalypse of John or the book of Revelation, uh, just different names for the same book, was written from Patmos. I go with the view that it was written uh, from Ephesus. In any event, while the Synoptic Gospels um, center in on the historical data of Jesus, including his birth, death, burial, and ascension, John's main focus was to explain, I think, certain doctrines, specific doctrines, in particular, uh, the deity of Christ. That becomes clear. Um, the Messiahship of Jesus is also stressed, the divine sonship and the savior of humanity. So you have a very strong Christology, study of Christ, Christology, a Christological theme throughout this gospel. Uh, this book is great to share with the cultists, you know, who deny oftentimes, 99% <laughs> of the time, they do divine, uh, d deny the divinity or the divine nature of Jesus. Um, now, the first verse in his gospel is very clear on Jesus' identity, who he truly is. Uh, John clearly seeks to set the record straight concerning the deity of Jesus. Arguably then, John, it seems, had various uh, heretics in mind or heretical teachings floating around in first century Palestine and sought to clarify any ambiguity uh, concerning Jesus being both God and man. He's not 50% God and 50% man. That would mean, you know, he'd have to slice off ha half of his divine nature. No, he's 100% God, 100% man. And, um, you know, sometimes we call that uh, he is the Theos Anthropos. Theos for God, theology, study of God, Theos in Greek, and then you have Anthropos, which is man, or anthropology, the study of man. So when we say God, man, Jesus, it's, it's the Theos, Anthropos, sort of, you know, sets the record straight there. It's not 50-50, uh, it's 100 and 100. Uh, he had to be 100% divine in order to represent the Trinity. He had to be 100% man in order to represent man, uh, and so on. So. The first verse, he's very, very clear. Now, 
As for our purposes in this study, there are three main categories that you need to keep in mind that you see in cultic thinking. One, false prophecy. Two, the denial of the deity, divine nature of Jesus. And three, a denial of the Trinity. And know this, whenever someone comes along with a new view or unique interpretation, it's probably a false one. You know, old is gold, my mentor used to tell me. So to go up against what has already been established as the main essentials of the Christian faith and blatantly go up against 2,000 years of theologians, um, you know, that someone is probably mistaken. You know, I look at Charles Taze Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witness. Uh, in all seriousness, he was 18 years old when he started the Bible study, became a pastor at the age of 20. He knew enough to be dangerous. But... Um, Having set that aside, we'll, we'll talk about him and uh, the Watchtower uh, translation of the scriptures in a few moments. But we need to also keep in mind when Jesus says, you know, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. You know, heavens and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. It's impossible for the Bible to be corrupted in that sense. You know, um, he says in John 16, verse 13, 13, you know, that the Holy Spirit would guide them, the apostles, into all truth. And furthermore, that the gates of hell would never prevail against the church in Matthew 16, 18. So when Joseph Smith says, look, which church should I join? And he was told, join none of them because they're all corrupt. You know, you see the same message in Islam. The people of the book have corrupted the Bible. The people of the book is what you read about in the Quran that refers to Jews and Christians. And, uh, so on so it's impossible um, Jesus says my words will never pass away the uh, Holy Spirit is going to guide you in all truth the gates of hell will never prevail against the church so uh, it's interesting um, to observe that people would rather follow you know uh, the Book of Mormon from the East Coast um, that can't be verified archaeologically uh, and has theological problems and, and heretical you know uh, ideology um, all over it uh, also, of course, Pearl of Great Price, uh, the Doctrine of Covenants. Uh, Book of Mormon is not so full of doctrine. That's more like an uh, Indiana Jones type of uh, exploration. And I don't mean to, to lessen its context, but uh, in any event. Uh, in verse 1 we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you translate that directly from the Greek, it sounds like this. In beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God, and God was the Word. So, the Jehovah's Witnesses, what they do is they add a God. They add the word a, which we call a definite article. So, here is a question, though. If Jesus is Michael the Archangel, then Jesus has nothing to do with creation. Yet we're told in Colossians 1 that nothing was created without him. Finally, angels are created beings and did not partake in creating the universe. And when Mormons, for example, say that Jesus is a spirit brother of Satan, uh, you have a problem there too because Jesus created the angels. He's not going to be brothers with his own creation. Um, a few other key passages that are clear on the teachings of the divine nature of Jesus versus you know, the cultic errors and others who deny his divine nature is John chapter 20 verse 28 and 29 also keep in mind Acts 59 we'll look at that too in a moment but in John 20 28 Thomas says my Lord and my God in the Greek that's the Lord of mine and the God of mine a Jewish man would never say my God to a man Thomas is confessing the divine nature of Jesus due to his resurrection from the dead he's genuinely adoring Jesus. Now, some Jehovah's Witness thinkers have said, no, Thomas is more cursing. He's saying, you know, my gosh, it's you? It's you? Thomas wouldn't be cursing, you know, so it doesn't fit the historical context either. Also, think of this when Jesus says, you know, I, before Abraham was, I am. You know, if you try to explain away that passage to mean anything else other than what it suggests, right, that I, before Abraham was, I am. Not only is he making a reference to the burning bush that spoke to Moses, but he's claiming an e that he's eternal, an eternality, if you will. Before Abraham was, I am. That's a long ago. So if 
you want to explain that away, it's kind of difficult because you've got to read the surrounding verses. The context is key. And the context, of course, is that the Pharisees picked up stones to stone him because they thought he was engaging in blasphemy. You know, you're not even 30 years old. How could you be before Abraham? And the I am this? I don't think so. So um, it's clear from the context, the verses above, the verses following that statement, that everyone who heard the words of Jesus knew what he implied. And of course, he proved his claims by raising himself from the dead, you know, raising others from the dead, uh, including performing a ministry of exorcisms and miracles and so forth. But just in case we miss these points, what did Jesus say? In verse 29, he says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Happy are those who do not see and yet believe. That's you and I. So if Thomas was engaging in blasphemy, then Jesus most likely would have corrected him, right? He was quick to correct Peter. Get behind me, Satan, right? So Acts 7, 59, you also have um, um, a verse that demonstrates the deity of Jesus. Uh, you have Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church, being stoned to death as he prayed, Lord, receive my spirit. Now, who's Lord here? Could that be Yahweh? Could it be, you know, who's he talking to? Stephen knew that to pray to a man is not only wrong, but clearly blasphemy. And to engage in blasphemy would be sin. So I don't think Stephen would do that. Doesn't fit the context. Doesn't fit what we know about Stephen in a New Testament context, uh, having, you know, spent much time with Jesus and so forth. Um, but it's clear when it says, Lord, receive my spirit, he's not addressing the Father, but Christ himself. Uh, now, another misinterpretation and misrepresentation among the ancient Gnostics, including the Jehovah's Witnesses today, is that Jesus is a spirit creature. And if this is correct, then Stephen is engaging in idolatry, right? He's not going to say, Lord, receive my spirit to a spiritual entity that's floating around. That would be idolatry. Of course, this is close, close to impossible for Stephen to engage in, in uh, idolatry because he was a close follower uh, and spent quite a bit, you know, lots of time with Jesus. All right, back to John. In um, chapter 14, verse 14, Jesus says to pray to him, all right? Ask in my name. If you ask anything in my name, that's asking in the name of Jesus. And that's how we pray, in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen, right? The New World Translation tries to change this. This is the Watchtower's Society of Translation of the New Testament, the New World Translation. And it says, um, it tries to make it sound like uh, you pray to the Father in his name, that you are literally praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, but you're not addressing Jesus himself. Um, that doesn't make much sense. If you can pray to Jesus, then he must be God and not just, of course, a created angel. Um, in John 1, verse 1, the Watchtower Society version reads, In the beginning, like I said earlier, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So they add the definite article. When they add the A, the definite article, uh, it, it's, it seems that they, they feel they can insert a definite article wherever they please, because it's not in the Greek. Yet, they don't do so consistently throughout their own translation. Why am I hitting Jehovah's Witnesses hard? Because they are abusing these verses. So they're not consistent in using the definite article, A, the letter A, uh, throughout their own translation. The Word of God is used, um, or the Word God, I should say, is used without the definite article in verses 1, 6, 12, 13, and then two times in verse 18. That's six times total. So why add it in verse 1? when it's not in the original Greek. Whatever the reasons are, it follows that they are lessening the nature of Christ while simply stressing his personality. Um, scholars agree that in the beginning, that phrase that John begins with by quoting, um, he's, he's sort of quoting Genesis 1, you know, in the beginning God. So he uses Genesis 1 verses 1 through 5 to establish the word the Lagos, Enarche en Halagos, um, to establish that the word Lagos, or word, as a pre-existent agent of creation, present with Yahweh, or Yahweh, uh, God the Father from the beginning. Um, Colossians 1, 15 through 17 uh, reads, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, 
all things, right, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So in Jesus, all things were created. Let's ask a question. What things? In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, takes care of the angelic realm as well. For whom? Through him and for him. And then, of course, at the end here, who is it that holds all things together? Is Jesus Christ. So during the creation moment, as God is of one essence, consisting of three persons, not three parts, not three personalities, three persons, uh, think of it this way, there's one what? One ontological divine substance or essence, if you will. There's one what that consists of three whom's. So all of them were involved in creation. Next, what we will do is, um, well, I'll see you in part two of John. All right? Blessings from Rome.